Uh, thanks for choosing to come along to um, this session on introduction to video on iOS. Um, for those of you that sort of were in my core data session yesterday, I apologize because I just copied and pasted all the slides from the beginning. So you can just fall asleep for the next few minutes. Uh, for those of you who weren't in that session yesterday, uh, just I'll quickly introduce myself again. So this session is about video on iOS. Uh, but before I introduce video, introduce myself. Uh, I'm currently working for the ABC where I'm developing mobile applications, including, a bit hard to see, but iView for the iPad. Uh, which is coming later this year. Before that, I worked for the BBC, working on mainly server-side code, uh, and before that, I worked at CSIRO. Um, but enough about me. That's the bit copied from my, yesterday's presentation that you've probably already seen. Okay, so basically, I'm gonna try and cover three things in this morning's session to do with video on iOS. And they, they are up here, preparing video, delivering video, and then playing the video. Uh, and we'll look at a range of different ways uh, to do each of these three things. So first of all, I'm gonna focus on uh, what's involved in preparing video for delivery on iOS. The first step, no matter how you're going to deliver your video or how you're gonna play your video, is to encode it, um, to compress the video into a smaller size using a particular algorithm. Now, I know, uh, Video Land Client, a quite a popular video player app, has been released for iPad recently, and you can play all sorts of different video formats. So it is possible to play video in a range of formats on iOS, but what I'm gonna talk about is the uh, features that Apple supports um, that are available through the SDK. And the only uh, codec that Apple supports for playback on iOS is H.264. Um, and so whilst there are ways of doing it in other ways, um, I'm gonna focus on encoding it you will always use H.264. Uh, and there are probably good reasons for sticking with the Apple-provided tools. Um, firstly, I believe there's some degree of hardware support for H.264 um, on some of the devices. Uh, and certainly, the video playback components that Apple give you are all geared around that format, um, and you get a lot for free. Uh, once you've encoded the video, you've got a choice to make. Uh, and that depends on how you want to deliver and play back the video. So there's basically two ways you can go. Uh, the first is to use progressive download. So that's where you encode your video, you package it up into a particular file, a single file, and you put it on a server somewhere. And then people that want to play the video access it through their devices, either through Safari or through a native app, uh, and download that video file. And whilst it's downloading, um, the playback can start. It's called progressive download. And if that's the approach that you want to take, then the second step after encoding is to package the video into one of these container formats that's supported on the device. So a .mov, .mp4, .m4v, or .3gp. Um, all of which are just different container formats for video that can be encoded in any encoding, but in this case, it'll all be H.264. The other route you can take, uh, and I think this one is slightly more interesting, so I'm gonna focus on it a bit more in this session, is if you use H, um, Apple's new proposed standard, which is HTTP live streaming. It's slightly misnamed because it's not just for streaming of live video, it's also for streaming of pre-recorded video or video on demand. Um, and if this is the format that you want to use, then you need to package it. Uh, what you'll end up with is a .m3u8 file, um, which is actually an index file that points to a bit more details about the stream, uh, but I'll get into that. If you choose to take this path of delivering it using HTTP live video, it also has implications for back at the first step, the encoding, because you'll need to actually encode it in, uh, in different ways, which I'll, I'll get into now. And sorry, I did mean to say at the start, um, if you have any questions at all throughout this session, please just shoot up your hand or just interrupt, certainly because we're also such a small group. Um, you know, I'd rather run this as a bit more of a discussion than just me standing up here the whole time. <coughs> talking, so if I mention something you want a bit more detail about, feel free to, you know, interrupt. So, this table up here um, lists, it's pulled from a, a document called Best Practices for Creating and Deploying HTTP Live Streaming. And this is a document that Apple have prepared to give you some guidance about how you should go about encoding video for delivery using this protocol. And as you can see, there's a range of different 
uh, devices, and I've kind of simplified the table. The one in their document has got a lot more details in it. So if you are going to encourage a video in this way, I encourage you to follow that link, which is actually a link. So when you get the slides, you've got to click through um, and look at the more detail. So it's basically a list of devices, a list of recommended dimensions, frame rates, total bit rate, and audio bit rate uh, to, to use encoding. So there are a few important things to note about this. I think the blue is completely broken. Yeah, okay. So uh, the top row should be highlighted, <laughs> um, which is that first encoding with a total bit rate of 64 kilobits per second. It's funny because the light blue is working, dark blue. Uh, no go. Um, the audio bit rate of 40 kilobits per second. So the, the crucial thing about this one is that the total bit rate must be no greater than 64 kilobits per second. So if you're going to deliver video using HTTP live streaming and you want people to access that video over a cellular network, so using the mobile phone rather than Wi-Fi, Apple require that you offer at least this encoding. You must have it in there. If you don't have an encoding less than 64 kilobits per second, they'll reject the app from the App Store. So it's, it's a requirement of if you're playing video over the cellular network, it must be done in this way. And I think that's, um, you know, I kind of asked questions at WWDC about why, you know, why such a low threshold, 64 kilobits per second is pretty low data rate. Um, and the sort of argument was that they want to guarantee the best possible user experience for the greatest number of people. So they want to deal with situations where you've got lots and lots of people using the same uh, cellular network cell, all wanting to watch video at the same time. Um, and if the network performance drops right down, they want at least some base level that will work. Um, I think it's probably also geared around the fact that they're maybe a bit US-centric and looking at the only network people have their iPhones on in the US is AT&T, which may not be as good as some of the networks we've got here. Um, but that's how it is. If you're going to deliver it over the cellular network, you need, you need that. Um, the next thing to take note of is this far column, which is the audio bit rate does not change depending on how you encode it. So the idea is that you encode the video in a range of different formats from low bandwidth up to the highest bandwidth you, you want to deliver. And you pick a variety to try and get a good spread. And what you're trying to do is um, allow people who have fast connections to experience the best possible video they can while still allowing for people with slower connections to get something. As I'll get explained in a little bit, the technology actually can jump back and forth between streams whilst the video is playing. So you could start off looking at a, a very high resolution version of the video, and then halfway through playback, if, if your network connectivity changes, it could drop down to a lower resolution. And the reason the audio needs to be encoded in the same for all streams is because um, it's a lot easier to hear the change between audio encodings, if you jump from one to the other, than it is to see instantly. You know, if a few frames start to go fuzzy, your eyes kind of fill in the blanks a little bit, and you don't necessarily notice such a dramatic change. Um, you probably know, pick up over time that suddenly the video is not quite as good, but it won't be kind of as jarring. So um, the guidance is to actually use an identical audio um, stream for all of your streams. So pick one which will work in all of them, and the suggestion is 40 kilobits per second. Uh, but then just change the video in order to achieve these total bit rates. So I've got some examples. Um, okay, now my audio is not working. Try that again. So this is a clip from At The Movies, from Sunday night, I think. Uh, and as you can see, that one's the lowest uh, frame rate, one frame per second. And in fact, when I looked at the stream, I encoded it with settings of one frame per second audio bitrate of 40 kilobits per second and video of 20 kilobits per second maximum. Um, but by the time it's actually got all of sort of the container stuff around it, 
it was higher than 64 kilobits per second. It was up around 70, so that would be rejected. Um, so really, a frame rate of one frame per second is actually still too high. The, the recommendation is you do an audio-only stream and then inject still images at a lower frequency than once per second. So it's basically really audio with maybe an image every minute or two to kind of sink in. Um, okay, the next one, you should see a bit of a difference. Okay, so that was um, 29 frames per second and a total bit rate of 640 kilobits per second. Same audio though. And now we're getting up into the sort of the mm. iPad. Ah. <coughs> the iPad size videos. So this is actually using the same bitrate, just a larger physical uh, dimensions. And when I looked at the files, in fact, this is smaller than the one produced at the lower physical dimensions. Really weird. Um, looks better. Sorry. <laughs> so I was saying that one uh, was in fact using the same target bitrate of 640 kilobits per second, but different physical dimensions when I exported it. And in fact, when I compared the file sizes of that to the previous one, which was the same target bitrate but a smaller dimensions, the larger one, physically larger one, actually came out to be a smaller file, uh, which is odd. So I think H.264 algorithm is very good at scaling, um, you know, physically. Uh, and finally, this is the sort of highest resolution one that I think looks okay. Let's just look at it a bit closer. So that's uh, a target bit rate of um, 1240 kilobits per second, which is probably starting to push it. I mean, I don't think you'd get away with that on the cellular network, really. People would have to wait a fair while. Uh, but certainly on Wi-Fi, if people have you know good broadband, um, you know. That's good quality video um, on a mobile device. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was, um, was packaging. How do you package up video for this HTTP live streaming? Well, if you're taking the live streaming approach, then the packaging is actually segmenting. What you do is you want to take your single video file and break it up into lots and lots of small files, individual segments. Uh, and each segment should be about the same length. Uh, I think the default with Apple's tools is 10 seconds, but you can choose whatever segment length you like. Um, and then each of these segments are basically lo loaded and transferred across the network as separate files. Um, they can all be put on content delivery networks. They can be cached um, by any web service in between. Um, but the main reason you break it up into segments like this is, is well, there are two reasons. One is to support just uh, random access or seeking to a, any point in a particular stream. Um, it just needs to start loading the segments from that point. Um, but the other is more about this being able to flexibly handle changing bandwidth. So what you end up doing is, in fact, not just creating one group of segments. You will encode your video a number of times, so in this example, three times. Uh, and then each of those three video files you'll segment into a number of different segments uh, and then produce an index file, which is called a variant playlist, that sits in front of the three streams and, and points to, to all of them. So the file you actually load up uh, or you point people to when you want them to play video is that index file. And what will happen is uh, 
the playback will start using one of the streams, and then if the network conditions change, it'll uh, seamlessly sort of fall over onto the, usually the lower bandwidth ones if it needs to, but it'll also boost back up to higher bandwidth as, as be. So you can see in this case, it's used three segments from the high bandwidth stream, two from the medium, and then three from the low. Okay, so I'd just like to do a bit of a demo now of taking you through how to actually do that process. Um, but before I do, were there any questions about the slides so far? No? Uh, have any of you actually covered all this before? You've used video in this way, done the segmenting? A few? Um, how about progressive downloads? Have people used that? Yeah, a couple. Recording stopped. Um, let's do another one. Okay. Um, ignore those plist files. Pretend they're not there, because we're going to create them in a second. So here I have uh, three, four. Uh, pre-encoded. I'm not going to do the video encoding live because that's really, really slow. Uh, I could probably have done the low one, uh, one frame per second. That would have only taken a few minutes. Um, but just trust me, I, I used um, QuickTime 7 to do this encoding. So uh, you, you can't, can't really encode in the manner that's suggested using QuickTime 10. So if you've installed all the updates, you'll have QuickTime 10 on your machine. Um, but you'll need to go and dig out QuickTime 7 uh, and QuickTime 7 Pro in order to have the fine-grained control over um, the encoding when you export video. Uh, there are a bunch of other ways of encoding video. There's an app called Handbrake, um, FFmpeg or something, uh, a bunch of commercial video encoding packages. Any of them will really do, um, or QuickTime 7. Uh, you can install 7 and 10 side by side. So QuickTime 7 is on the operating system disk for the latest OS, it's in the optional installs package. And if you go in there, you can install just QuickTime 7 and it'll put it un in applications utilities QuickTime 7. Um, and then you can choose file export um, and choose custom settings and then you've got the control that you need. That's what I did to create these four videos. So I've got one which is, these are the four that I showed you before. Um, I don't want to watch it in iTunes. So this is the one frame per second one, and the medium, that's the very high one. You've seen them all already. Uh, so what I'm going to do is now do the segmenting of these four differently encoded videos into create four HTTP live stream streams, and then um, create the index for them all. So I hope you don't mind if I use my cheat sheet. Right, so what I'm using here is a command line tool called Media File Segmenter, uh, and it's freely available from Apple. The arguments, can you guys read that okay? Uh, I've got it on a slide, but the arguments basically are a base URL, which is the URL that is gonna be the prefix for all my video. When people access it through the web server, it's the start part of the URL before the video files come. Um, and then the file base, so which is a local file system passed to the same sort of location. Um, and that can be a mounted file system. Um, it doesn't have to be a local file system. And then um, the name that I want for the index file to be. Then I've got an argument which is saying I want to generate a variant property list for this stream. And then I'm referring to the video file I want to segment. So if I run that, it goes through and it's created a bunch of segmented files for me. So it should have put them in. There. Uh, so that was the low one. It created all of those files. So an index file and then a bunch of segments. Um, just so you can see, I'm not making this up. There's the medium one, which you're about to do, and it's empty. 
So I've got the same command, but now referring to the medium file. It's gone through and now created all the segments for the medium file. So I'll just repeat that for the high res version and the very high res version. Okay, so now all of these, oh, we just looked at medium, uh, high and very high have content. So as you can see, segmenting is fast. This is like, you know, if you think about encoding that, like the very high resolution one, I think to encode a two minute clip took like half an hour or something on my Mac Mini at home. Um, segmenting, you know, a matter of seconds. So it's not actually doing much. All it's doing is taking the file and chopping it into bits. Um, it's not re-encoding it. It's not processing the video in any way at all. It's simply a file operation. Dave, yeah. um, does that tool take care, I mean, how does it make sure that, say, there's a keyframe inside of each slice or more, or does it not matter? Does it literally just pick a, like, you know, byte thing and put it into the file? Yeah, really good question. I don't know the answer. Uh, I think it is just a file operation. So I think that um, it's up. Can you up go find a keyframe in 10 seconds of, of a frame rate of one frame per yeah, well, second? True. But there, the, in the, um, that best practices guide, it does talk about wanting, making sure that the settings you use for keyframes when you're exp encoding the video needs to be compatible with the segment length that you've picked, such that there is at least one keyframe in each segment. But I don't think you need to do anything special to make sure that's at the beginning of the segment. Um, yeah. So the next, the next step now we've got these. So we could play any of these that we like. So let's, I mean, should we play the medium one? Um, I, hope, I think this will work, I haven't tried it. Should do. So I should be able to just drag that index file into Safari. So if you drag a file onto the simulator, it's like, oh, oh right, that's probably too high res. Okay, it's making a liar out of me. Um, they should be playable. Maybe it's just... Yeah, don't. I'm suspicious now. I really want to test this. Um, right, it's probably because it's got to go through a web server. So it's got to go through a web server. You can't just use file system parts. Um, and so you can just use a single stream, segmented, as a way of delivering video. The next step that I'm going to do, which is about a variant playlist, is all about making support for failover uh, for network delivery. So if you're, if you're using live streaming and you're releasing the app in the App Store and you want people to access it over the cellular network, really you have to do what the next step. Otherwise, your only stream will be the slow 60 kilobits per second one. Um, however, if you're not constrained by those things, you just want to deliver video um, to apps that aren't in the App Store, or you want to deliver it to um, web uh, browser, then you could just use one encoding if you like. Um, you wouldn't get the benefit of the, the failover. So the next step is, is to create a variant playlist. So again, I'm just using my cheat sheet. This is a bit harder to see, isn't it? Because it's down the bottom. The, the tool, and I've got these in a bit more detail on the slides. Uh, the tool is called Variant Playlist Creator. You specify a, f a flag O, which is the name of the output file, so the path to and the name of the playlist you want to create, and then uh, a number of pairs. And the pairs are the URL to the index file for the stream and the file path to the variant playlist property list file you created when you segmented that stream. So you remember I had that option when I segmented the streams that I wanted to create one of those for each. Okay, that was even faster. So what that's done is now created this top level 
uh, variant playlist, which just lists the fact that there are four streams available uh, and what the bit rate of each of those streams is. So if I go back to here, instead of going directly to the medium stream, I just go to this top level. So can you see which uh, stream it started playing? Let, let me start that again. Oh. I think it was caching. Yeah. Let me let me type a URL in. Maybe if you did through the like in the app menu you can um, wipe the iPhone. Oh no, so it wasn't caching, it was just um when I cancelled it went back to the previous page, which was the video that I'd yeah, hand crafted to point at the medium one. So I'll go back in here and um clear that and just put in the full URL. It's one. It's hard to see with these titles. But what you should have seen is that it started off playing the one frame per second video. And then after, a, it wasn't even, a, was it a full segment? 10 seconds, yeah. After a segment, it promoted itself. It went, well, let's see if I can, if I can manage the next highest bandwidth. Uh, and it found that it could, so it started playing a higher bandwidth stream. Um, now that's kind of all right. It's nice that it's being adaptive for us, but um, I don't really want every single user that accesses this video to have to watch, you know, 10 seconds of horribly slow. With, with these um, titles, it actually kind of look, still looks good. I'm amazed at how well this title sequence works at one frame per second. Um, but all the same, I, it's not how I'd like it. So it's probably to do with the order I specified the streams in when I created that variant playlist. But rather than recreate it, I thought I could just edit it by hand. These files are not complex at all. It's just a text file, and it's just a list of URLs. Um, so there's some metadata. Uh, I don't even know what the header means. I guess it means it's a M3U file. Uh, this one refers to a stream, and you can see that the last, the program ID of all of the streams is the same. That's because it's the same content. Uh, the bandwidth of all of the streams is different. So it's basically the metadata says, okay, the bandwidth of this stream is, I think this is bytes, because um, that's the lowest res one. And there's the URL for it. And then we've got the bandwidth of another one. Uh, and this is the medium. And you can see here that the large or high is actually lower than the medium, but anyway. So uh, let's pick this one as the default. So it, what it will default to is the one that appears at the top of this file. So if I move to that um, other one to the top and go through this ridiculous rigmarole. Yes, I know. Typing the URL in again. Okay, so it now defaults to that higher quality one. Okay, so you could even go one step further if you wanted to, um, and in fact, Apple encourage you to in some cases, uh, is to actually create two of these variant playlist files pointing to the same set of streams. So what I could do is I could uh, save this one as my kind of Wi-Fi default, and then I could create a different version of this file that just reorders the streams so that a lower uh, bandwidth stream is in the first spot and make that my cellular network file. And then uh, use, if you're doing a native app, use the reachability APIs um, to determine how that device is connected to the network, whether it's on Wi-Fi or cellular, and then choose to play the particular playlist based on that. So that way you know that people that are on a cellular network will default to 
a encoding that's appropriate for them, and people on a Wi-Fi network will, will default to an encoding that's appropriate for them. Um, you may not want to bother with that. You may just want to do one and pick a middle of the road uh, as the default. Uh, I think. Right, so um, that was the demo of segmenting. Um, as you, I just recap that I used the media file segmenter. It's a command line tool available. It's not installed by default. You need to download it, and it's in an odd spot. It's at connect.apple.com, and not many things are still there. It's kind of the old Apple developer website. Um, and from downloads, go to QuickTime, and then go to a section called HTTP Live Streaming Tools. And if you download that, you get the media file segmenter. You get an equivalent called the media stream segmenter, which is for doing live video streams. So um, video that's not pre-recorded, but that's happening right now, uh, is, is packaged in the exact same way. So instead of using the media file segmenter to point to a file, you use the media stream segmenter with all the same arguments and point it to a stream, uh, an MPEG-2 transport stream. Um, and it will segment that transport stream into the exact same kind of file format. And the only difference is if we look at one of these um, stream index files, the only difference with a live stream is that it doesn't have that end list tag. So that end list tag says that this stream has finished at that point. Um, and so when the player encounters that, it will no longer try and load segments for that. Um, if I was to remove that tag, this would basically look identical to a live stream. Um, and so you can see each one of these uh, says there's an hour segment. Segments each have a different name. And there's a sequence. Um, so you yeah, so it's target duration of 10 seconds because I set it up to do 10 second segments. They don't all have to be the same segment length. If they're not, the file becomes a little bit more complex. It seems like the last one is 11 It is. <laughs> there you go. Um, so one of the really cool things about the fact that the uh, pre-recorded video and the streaming video use the exact same method of delivery is that if you want to take a live stream and make it available for downloads after the event, all you have to do is add that to the end of the live stream index file, and it's done. There's no sort of repackaging of it. It's not. There's no, you know, takes one second, I guess, to take your the result of your live stream and then say now it's an archived version available for download, which is pretty cool. Um, however, the other thing to keep in mind is by default in a live stream, the list doesn't just get arbitrarily large. It will just include a window of the previous X um, segments. So if the stream goes for an hour, um, a given index file may actually only include the last 15 minutes worth of segments. Um, and that's you can uh, specify how you want that to behave based on how far you want people to be able to go back and in the stream. OK. And uh, here is a, if you didn't manage to write it down before if you're trying to. Um, here's the arguments for media file segmenter. So base URL, file base, the name of the index file, that argument generate variant playlist is just a single sort of flag, and that's to say, sorry, generate variant property list, and that's to, to generate a property list file that describes this variant so that later on you can use the variant playlist creator tool to create a variant playlist for it. And here is the arguments for the variant playlist creator tool. So again, you just specify the um, path and the name of the variant playlist you want to create, and then pairs of URLs and the path to that property list for each of the streams. So this one's actually got only three, and I did four in the end. OK, so that's, um, that's preparing video covered. Uh, any questions so far? No. No? OK. I guess it was all straightforward. So uh, if you don't have any questions about preparing, then delivering is even easier, because all you do is stick it on a server somewhere. That's kind of literally it. right? So both progressive downloads and HTTP live streaming use HTTP 
as the delivery mechanism. So the same protocol is used to deliver pretty much everything on the web. Um, and the benefit of this is standard web servers, standard proxies, port 80, uh, it's not going to be blocked by firewalls. So it really is as simple as sticking on a server somewhere. So either stick your, your file, the original video file in the case of progressive download, or all of the segments and the index file in the case of a HTTP live streaming uh, on a server, give people the URL, consider it delivered. Um, there's a few details, but only a real few. So the first one applies to progressive downloads, which is basically a single file that hasn't been segmented uh, containing your video. And that is that your server should support byte range requests if you want to have the best experience delivering progressive downloads. And what that is, is um, it's part of the HTTP protocol whereby when the client sends a request for a particular URL, instead of just getting everything of that URL, it can actually send a byte range that it's interested in. So it can say, just give me the first 100 bytes of whatever's at this URL, please, or give me the second 100 bytes. And how this is used in delivering progressive downloads is if the um, user drags the playback head to halfway through the video to sort of seek halfway through, uh, and it hasn't already pre-buffered and downloaded all of that, the client will then send a byte range request starting at about halfway through the video file to say, please give me content from here on. Um, it is a standard part of the protocol. Most web servers support it, but it may not be passed on by all proxies and not necessarily all web servers support it and some may have turned it off. So, oh, and here's a picture that kind of demonstrates that, although you can't see the nice person. Ah, that's a range, a byte range halfway through. Um, so, Good way of checking is just using the um, curl command line tool. So it's got, it allows you to specify a range when you make a request. Just use dash r and then the bytes. So I'm saying I want bytes 100 through 199 of that file, please, and I want you to stick the result in that file. Um, and the response you should get should look something like that. It's got 100 bytes. Um, and then a check to make sure the file has some content about 100 bytes worth of content. If it does, you've probably got support for byte range requests and you don't need to do anything. If it doesn't, then try and figure out why byte range requests aren't working. Um, Apache has them on by default. Uh, so the second uh, details apply to HTTP live streaming, and that is that you need to add the MIME type support for the M3U8 index file, which is an application XMPEG URL type and the um, transport stream, which is an MPEG-2 transport stream. So if you add those MIME types to your web server, um, that's pretty much all you, you need to do. The other kind of more tricky bit is um, making sure that the time to live or the caching policies for files delivered on your web server are appropriate based on the segment length of your segments. So there's a little bit of details um, if you in the end of this, I've got some um, further references. In there, there's some information about how to tune your caching to make sure. So you, you do want to cache the um, segments. It gives a better performance if things along the way can actually keep them. So rather than having to get it off of your web server each time, people can just get it off their ISP or you know, a local cache or whatever. But you just want to make sure, especially for delivering live streams, so that you're not over caching. So that's all there is to delivery. Um, it is really that, that simple. Does, any questions? Although I've now said it's really simple, you might not feel like you can ask, but please, if it wasn't clear. No? Okay. Uh, so playing video, and we've got, what, 20 minutes left? Right, there's two ways to do video. Well, there's lots of ways to do video. I'm going to talk about two ways to do video. Um, one is to deliver video to a web application, a web page, um, the Safari web browser on iOS typically. Uh, the other is to deliver video in a native application. I'll talk about each of those. Okay, so the first one, again, is really simple. Um, especially if you're delivering it to iOS, you can pretty much rely. People have got Safari, they've got WebKit. Um, you saw before I was using Safari to load just the video file. I was just typing in the URL to the video and it was playing. So you could do that. Um, or if you want to include the video within a web page, so they're navigating around a web page and they see the video, uh, this is the HTML. So it's HTML5 video. Uh, the tag is this video tag. 
Controls is a, just a Boolean to say you want the controls to be available for the player. And then you just provide the source to the file. And the close video tag. Um, let's have a quick look at what that looks like. I think I put front row on. I did. Sorry. I'm all thumbs today. Stop it. <laughs> so I think I've got a file called video.html. No, it's not in the video directory. It's one level up. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, it's very small, isn't it? How do I do my pinch? Zoom. Right, so I, I could probably have done with some CSS to change the default uh, size. But here you go, I've loaded the video. I hit play. I've got the video. You're probably really sick of this video by now. Uh, done, and it goes back in. So. You know, it's a slightly nicer experience because when you, they hit done, it doesn't reload the previous page. Um, so it's worth doing. Uh, and you can see that they get the default controller. Um, go full screen. Jack, on the iPad, would that just play embedded in the web page or does it open up a full screen and play the same? Yeah, good question. Um, I think it plays embedded. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is you can play it embedded using a JavaScript controller. So um, you can actually, there are JavaScript APIs for controlling video playback. Yep. Can't you just choose hardware from the hardware menu, choose device or iPad? Or iPhone 4 even. No. So it's certainly possible. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you just need some different markup. Let's go iPad. Yeah, there you go. And so then you get these little um, full screen back to within page. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. Thanks. Right, so that's, um, that's HTML delivery. The next is uh, what do you have to do to include it in a native app? Um, oops. And if you don't mind, I might just, rather than do it in front of you, use one I prepared earlier. Because I want to move on to something else afterwards if we've got time. So I'll just open up my pre-baked video player. Uh, and take you through the code. So what I did here, um, I created a new project for an iPad application, a view-based iPad application. Uh, I went to resources, right-clicked and choose add existing framework and added the media player framework um, in order to get playback. I then went into interface builder, maybe. And added a view to uh, my interface. So just a UI view, dragged it on, gave it a black background color, because video is all about black backgrounds. Uh, and then I went back into Xcode and made sure I had a reference to that view and hooked it up. And then in the view did load method of my view controller, uh, I wrote this code. So 
I uh, just created a URL that pointed to uh, the video I would like to play. And then I initialized an MP movie player controller. Uh, and I initialized it with that content URL. I then set the frame of my movie player controller's view to the bounds of that UI view that I dragged on, which is going to be the parent view that's going to have the video playback view embedded within it. And then I did exactly that. I uh, told my video parent view to add as its sub view um, the view of the MP movie player controller. And then I've said to the player to, to simply play. So if I build and run this now, hopefully. Yeah, there you go. Um, I've clearly done something wrong because when I rotate it, it. Yeah. So let's just pretend I haven't done that bad thing. Maybe if I go full screen, then rotate. Maybe. Yeah, that looks good. Until I want to leave full screen and then I'm just confused. Ah, so, uh, we're back to. Okay. Love rotating. Uh, so that's, yeah. That's the MP Movie Player Controller. The other class that uh, you can use instead of the MP Movie Player Controller if you want. So this is the class to use if you want to be able to have video playing that's not full screen. If you want it to be able to be uh, a partial view and then toggle between full screen and partial view. If you just want full screen video, you might want to look at MP Movie Player View Controller. Sounds very similar. But which is simply a view controller that you can then present modally. So you can just say present modal with whatever transition you want. Um, and it's a view controller that has an instance of one of these players and it's all set up for you. Uh, okay, so I've got 10 minutes left. I wanted to quickly show you something else that I think is kind of cool. And I saw it at one of the sessions at WWDC and it was mentioned in one slide and I thought that's really awesome, I'd like to do something with it. And then I went looking for documentation about it and there's basically none. There's a, a couple of references to the fact that it's possible to do, but there's not really anything that tells you how to do it. So I ended up having to go back to that WWDC session video and go watch through to that one slide, and I found the one slide that has a little bit of syntax, file syntax on it, and kind of figured out how to hook it all together. So I thought I'd show you um, in case you think it is also kind of cool. And that's adding metadata to a stream. So HTTP live streaming now supports timed metadata. So any stream, you can inject metadata at various times throughout the stream. And then whilst the video is playing, whether that's within a web view um, or within Safari or in a native app, you can then receive events when that metadata occurs with the metadata and allow you to do stuff based on it, which I think is really interesting. So let's have a quick look at it. Um, basically, Oh, here's some I created earlier. I won't create them all now. I'll just talk through what I would do. Uh, so the first step is to create some metadata that you want to inject into the video. And to do this, there's a command line tool that comes with those HTTP live streaming tools called ID3 Tag Generator. Um, and the arguments to ID3 Tag Generator are dash O, which is the output file where you want to write this ID tag. So I'm just calling my first one 1.id3. Um, and then the various um, id3 tags you'd like to write out to that file. Uh, and if you look at the id3 tag generator's man page, you can see a bunch that are supported. So dash text is just default text. Dash URL is for, for including a URL. And there's some that are kind of more specific to say music. So dash artist. Um, so in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to annotate this at the movies video with metadata so that every time David mentions an actor's name, which he tends to do a lot in his reviews, um, you'll be able to get some metadata about that actor. So I call the actor an artist, which is kind of, well, it's better than just you know a text, but it's not quite right. Um, so here I'm saying dash artist Emma Stone, dash URL, and then the URL to Emma Stone's profile page on the Internet Movie Database website. So uh, I won't do that all now. I did that seven times with each of these artists, Patricia Clarkson, Stanley Tucci, 
Alison Michaela, Thomas Hedden Church, Lisa Kudrow, and then the director, Will Gluck. So that's the first step. Create an, a single file containing the ID3 tags, and each of these commands is putting two tags in the file, an artist and a URL. Um, you can put as many as you like. Uh, the file contains the tags that you want injected at a given moment. So um, I want the name and URL to be injected together, and then the reason I've got separate files is because later on I want, at different times, those others to be injected. Then you need to create a macro file. Um, don't use the heading macro file. It's just a text file, uh, and it contains on each line, first of all, the number of seconds uh, into the video that you want to inject this, um, this content. Then the fact that it's an ID3 tag. I don't know what else is possible because the sample just had ID3, so. Uh, and again, um, there's no documentation. And then the path to the ID3 tag. So one per line. So you can see here I've got this at 68 seconds. Uh, obviously, David mentions Emma Stone. At 78 seconds, he mentions Patricia Clarkson, and so forth. Uh, and then finally, when you're doing the segmentation with Media File Segmenter, there is an argument, which is meta macro file. Uh, so that's documented in the man page for Media File Segmenter, but it doesn't tell you what file format that file should be. It just says, if you've got some metadata, uh, provide it with the meta macro file argument point to the file. Uh, so if you then say which is the macro file for that, that stream, then when it's doing the segmenting, it'll insert the metadata at the appropriate times. Um, so let's see what that, how that works. Hopefully it will work. It may not. So we're going to have to actually watch a minute or so of the video now. Because it takes a while to get going. I'm sorry the video is so bad on that screen. Looks much nicer here. And Zach Efron is torn between the living and the dead in Charlie's and Flower. But they say it's a fat, easy A. Right, so well, we should see Emma Stone attends high school early. in the small town of OJ, California, population 8,000, where she lives with her non judgmental parents, Rosemary, Patricia Clarkson, and Dill, Stanley Tucci. She rejects the invitation of her best friend, Rihanna, Annie Kalka, to spend a weekend. So you can see what's going on here, can't you? Each time I'm receiving some of that metadata, I'm creating a button, adding it to a scroll view. Um, and that button is hooked up to a method, which when you tap on it, hang on, I want to see if it actually scrolls. Maybe. OK, I won't wait. Uh, if you tap on the button, if my internet connection's working, and it's not. OK, you'll just have to trust me. Uh, oh, there we are. It's loaded the profile from IMDb, um, which is kind of cool. For some reason, the video's gone when I come back. It's still playing, but. Yeah, I don't think you meant to present views over the top of video whilst it's playing. Um, but this all still works, so I can, you know, idea being whilst you're watching this, you might be interested in reading a little bit about Stanley Tucci. Uh, it'd probably work better on an iPad app, wouldn't it, where you could actually have the video still visible and display something on the side. The reason I've done it in an iPhone app is because it's only available in iOS 4 and later. Uh, so, there we are in this Thomas Eden Church. There's also a JavaScript API to receive this metadata, um, but I found even less documentation about that other than there is a JavaScript API. Full stop. It's like, okay. Uh, so if you could figure it out, um, you could do it within a um, video being delivered on the web. 
So uh, just quickly summarizing, that's the uh, ID3 tag generator. Yep. On that metadata, is it only being sent to the client when that actual client... Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. Sorry, I missed... I should have shown you that, that, that method, shouldn't I? So um, what I did was registered for a notification. Right, so I'm registering for this MP movie player timed metadata updated notification, which is in the documentation. Uh, and I'm saying go to this method metadata update. And in that method, I can ask the player for its timed metadata property, which is a MP timed metadata object. Again, this is in the documentation. Um, and then that's basically a dictionary and there are keys and values. And you can see I had to do a whole heap of just printing out all the keys and values because I had no idea what format it would be in. Uh, and I figured out that text, um, text ID3 tags have the key TPE1, uh, URL ID3 tags have the key WXXX, uh, and then the values for the associate objects have the key value. Uh, and so I could pull that out. So this method will only be called uh, when that timed metadata happens. And what's more, if you seek back and forth, like rewind to go back or just drag the playback head past, you'll get it as well when you go, when you encounter that time in the video as well. So the benefit is, I mean, you could already do this using a separate stream of metadata, but then you as a developer are responsible for synchronizing access to the video and the metadata. And if, you know, video playback stalls, you've got to then, you know, take account of that. Um, having it actually in the stream just means that once it's in there, you can just register for these um, notifications and, and you've got it. So, yeah, that was uh, the uh, syntax for ID3 tag generator. Um, this is the syntax for the macro file. And there's some important things to note, which is that it's in seconds, that these are spaces and not tabs. And there's a new line at the end of the last line in the file. If you make any of those mistakes, it won't work. Um, and then that's the argument you need to include to media um, file segmenter when you're creating the media file segment. You can also add metadata to streams, in which case the media stream segmenter takes a port argument that you want it to listen to, and then it will listen to that port, and you can send metadata to that port whilst the stream is happening uh, to inject metadata at that point in time. Again, I don't quite know what file format you send to that port. Uh, maybe just the binary ID3 data, had a guess. Um, and that's the notification you need. MP, movie player time, metadata updated notification, only available in iOS, iOS 4 and later. Right. Uh, yep, next steps. So uh, read the getting started with audio and video, read using video in the multimedia programming guide, and watch the advances in HTTP live streaming sessions. There are two of them from WWDC this year. Uh, any other questions before it's lunch time? No, it's not, is it? No, we've got one more session before lunch. I'm still on yesterday's time. Uh, so any other questions before the next session? No? Okay, thank you very much.